Hello, welcome to Look North on this Monday evening. Our top story tonight. A man guilty of sexually exploiting a child is ordered to pay almost half a million pounds to the woman he abused. All I've seemed to have been doing is consistently battling for justice, for the authorities to listen, for proper punishment. We'll have full details of this landmark ruling. Also tonight, both boys need support, but only one gets a place at a special school. Such stuff as dreams are made on. Leeds University put their 400-year-old edition of Shakespeare's complete works on display. And go steady, Eddie. We meet the Cocker Spaniel who fell more than 100 feet off a cliff and can still wag his tail with the best of them. After a sunny day for most, there will be a frost tonight and then uh, milder but wetter weather on the way through the rest of the week. Join me for that detailed week ahead forecast. Hello, thank you for starting your week with us here on Look North. First tonight, a man who was jailed for abusing a girl aged 14 in a Rotherham flat has been ordered to pay her almost half a million pounds in compensation. A solicitor representing the grooming survivor known as Liz is calling it a landmark case which could mean other women are able to make claims against their attackers. Ashgar Boston was convicted in 2018 and released last year after serving five years in jail. Our Home Affairs correspondent Emma Glasby has our top story. She was 14 when she was groomed and sexually abused in Rotherham. Her attacker was sentenced to nine years in prison and served five. Now the High Court has ordered him to pay the woman known as Liz £425,000 after she took civil action in the High Court. I didn't feel like I'd got proper justice and I was approached with this idea of let's try and do it. So I was told it was going to be a test case and did I want to help doing it. I decided to go with it, not having my hopes up, but we've managed to get results. It'll never heal the past. We will always walk in these shoes, but it's about closing a chapter. Her abuser, ex-taxi driver Askar Bostan, has had his assets frozen. If he doesn't pay, his assets could be sold and the money given to Liz. She hopes her case will be a turning point for all those groomed and abused as children. So I've always felt that the judicial process, it doesn't work for victims. We've been walking around with years and years full of trauma, psychological damage. That's all I've seemed to have been doing is consistently battling for justice, for the authorities to listen, for proper punishment. The J report said that around 1,400 children in Rotherham had been sexually abused over a 16-year period. These just some of the men convicted. There were others in Bradford, Huddersfield and other towns and cities across the country. Liz's solicitor says this case is the first of its kind for a survivor of the grooming gang scandal, but he predicts there will be more. The way I would think of it is, is like um, an icebreaker. Like you, know, you get get a ship go through the ice, uh, it it breaks the ice. It it allows others to follow. Liz has been very brave, and um, I would commend her for it. And um, if, if the money is not paid, um, then we will get an order for sale of um, uh, Mr. Boston's house. For Liz, the judgment and what it could mean is slowly starting to sink in. I'm, I'm feeling pretty proud to be stood here today saying this is what I've done and that this could help so many people. I'm hoping that survivors can take something from this and know that when you fight and you don't give up, you can get results. Well, Emma's with us now. As we heard there, it's been called a landmark ruling. How significant is this, Emma? Well, clearly for Liz, it is significant and she is hoping that it will be for others too. These legal proceedings started in 2020. Liz, as she is known, was frustrated by the nine-year sentence given to her abuser, by his later move to an open prison and by the fact that he was released from prison after serving five years. 
We wait to see if this means that other survivors will come forward to take legal proceedings against their abusers, but Liz and her solicitor are hoping that this could be something of a landmark case for other survivors of grooming and abuse. As you mentioned, Liz says she felt let down by the judicial system. Has anything changed in terms of jail sentencing since this case? Well, it has. The Ministry of Justice has given us a statement today about sentencing, saying that sex offenders are closely monitored by the police and probation service and face some of the strictest licence conditions. And it has also pointed out that it has now ended the halfway release of offenders sentenced to four or more years in prison for serious violent and sexual offences. Instead, they will have to spend two-thirds of their time behind bars. Emma, thank you. Meanwhile, the Leeds-based charity Rape Crisis UK published its own report today which showed victims of sexual offences are often waiting years for cases to come to trial. They're calling for specialist courts to be created with trained staff to better look after victims. When someone's been through that really traumatic experience of rape or sexual assault or sexual abuse, and then they have to go through a, a court system that is, is not keeping them informed and is delaying their cases time after time for so many years, that of course they feel marginalised and it feels like another injustice on top of what they've already experienced. Next tonight, look at these little cuties, aren't they gorgeous? Jasper and Reuben. Well, their parents of the twin boys from York say that they feel let, that they're part of a horrible experiment because only one of them has been given a place at a special school. They have autism, they're four years old. Uh, and Jasper has been offered a place at Hobmore Oak School, leaving brother Reuben to attend a mainstream school instead. Both boys are described as having significant learning difficulties. Our reporter Mark Ansell takes up their story. Our children aren't going to start talking. They're not going to be toilet trained. They're, you know, so they're going to be going to school non-verbal, in nappies. And the idea that that's got to be catered for in mainstream is difficult to stomach, really. Rhiannon and Pete Hale say accepting that their autistic, non-verbal twins would not cope at mainstream primary school was hard enough. Now they're struggling to come to terms with the local authority's decision to offer only Jasper a place at oversubscribed special school Hobmore Oaks in York, while Reuben only has a place at mainstream school. They say their identical twins have the same needs. It's hard to comprehend, it's hard to stomach, it feels like a, an experiment really that the, the two boys are going to be at different provisions, you know, they're... Um, they're being set on different trajectories in life, um, you know, and the four years old, the twins, they need each other, um, um, but one's going to have a lot more support than the other in the two different school provisions. How worried are you about Jasper and Ruben's future? We're, yeah, we're very worried and full of grief yet again for the, the, school, the school years that we thought that they were going to have of them being taken away from them and that does leave you feeling really uncertain, really worried and grief is the only way that I can describe how it feels. In a statement, City of York Council says clearly it would not be appropriate for us to discuss individual cases in public other than to say that we are continuing to work with the family to find suitable provision. The allocation of special school places always takes account of the circumstances of individual children. Pete and Rhiannon, who are both former teachers and now run a nursery, say their situation is symptomatic of a lack of funding for special educational needs schools. I'm on a support group, a WhatsApp group called Our Awesome Preschoolers, and that is just based in, in York, and there's 40 people on there with preschool children who have applied for Hobmore Oaks and other special schools, and hardly any of them have got in. So, yes, this is a unique situation because it's twins, but this is, hot, this is happening far too often, and there is not enough provision. Jasper and Reuben's parents are prepared to take their case to a tribunal, but that could take around a year by which point it'll be too late. The boys start school in September. Mark Ansell, BBC Look North, York. Well, such an anxious time for the parents, isn't it? I've been speaking to Tim Nichols from the National Autistic Society to get his reaction to this case. These are two children who are, well, they're identical twins. They're going to be incredibly close and also they're autistic. And they may be really uh, going to struggle if they're, if they're separated. So frankly, 
this is a pretty baffling decision. If you have two children with identical needs who need the same support, how have they ended up with such a different um, solution apparently coming through? We reported recently on special needs schools turning families away. How desperate is the situation? The special educational needs system in England is, is broken. We here at the National Autistic Society of, from parents of autistic children who have to wait a year, sometimes even more than three years, a quarter told us they waited more than three years to get the support that they need for their children. And that's because there aren't enough spaces of the right types of schools in the right places and there isn't the right training and understanding within schools to support children without who might be well supported in mainstream school and without the right investment from government and so that all local authorities and councils have what they need we're not going to see that situation change well the government has committed to 400 million pounds in funding for CERN are you confident that that will help we saw a lot of announcements a couple of weeks ago around the future of the SEND system. What we haven't seen yet is the detail or enough about actually the true scale of the investment that is needed to solve this crisis. As I said, the whole of the SEND system is broken. And although it sounds like a lot of money, frankly, I don't think it's going to be enough to touch the sides when you consider just how bad things are for families and for for children up and down the country at the moment. As you've indicated, there's many more children in the same situation as Jasper and Reuben, although maybe not, not twins. What's your advice? Any parent that's in this situation, I do I recommend, please get in touch with us uh, at our, our website, autism.org.uk, and we can see how we can help. But for parents like Jasper and Reuben's, they're doing the right thing. It's the thing that they shouldn't have to do in order to get the right support for their child as well, and that is to fight. And we know that far too many cases end up going through appeals processes and to tribunals. And in the vast majority of cases, they win. And that, again, just demonstrates how far in this uh, system has to go before it's no longer broken. You're watching Monday's Look North, still to come on tonight's programme. Football club without a ground after lawn munching bugs ate the pitch. OK, time for some other stories coming into our newsroom this evening. The Home Secretary has offered her condolences after the death of a student police officer who was training with West Yorkshire Police. 21-year-old Anugra Abraham was from Bury on a placement in Halifax as part of an apprenticeship degree at Leeds Trinity University. The MP for Bury South told the Commons his family want the circumstances to be investigated by the Independent Office for Police Conduct. Anu Abraham was a 21-year-old student police officer on a placement in West Yorkshire who took his own life following bullying allegations and a lack of support. I met Anu's family on Friday and they wanted to make clear that they feel the harm and lack of support Anu experienced at the hands of the police killed him. The family now want Anu's death and the miscommunication that followed to be reviewed by the IOPC. Will the Home Secretary or the Policing Minister meet with myself and Nanu's family to hear their concerns and dis uh, to discuss what can be done to prevent any further tragedy? Uh, I'm very happy to uh, arrange some kind of appropriate meeting between uh, an official or a minister at the Home Office uh, and the Honourable Gentleman, should that be the right thing to do. Well, West Yorkshire Police say they take allegations of bullying and discrimination within the force very seriously. The force says it's referred itself to the Independent Office for Police Conduct, but they decided a local investigation would be appropriate. The IOPC says the family will have the right to have the force's handling of the matter reviewed by the IOPC upon conclusion of the investigation. An 18-year-old pedestrian has died after he was hit by a car on the A64 in North Yorkshire. Police say the teenager was hit by a black BMW on the eastbound carriageway in the very early hours of this morning and he died at the scene. The driver is helping police with their inquiries and the victim's family have been informed and are being supported. The road remains closed eastbound between Tadcaster and Acaster Bryan. Ascombe Bryan, sorry. Former Sheffield Wednesday and Leeds United footballer Carlton Palmer has revealed he completed the Sheffield Half Marathon despite suffering a suspected heart attack during the race. Palmer, seen here with his wife before the race, updated his fans via Twitter saying that he has been kept in hospital while tests were carried out. He finished the 13-mile course in two hours and nine minutes. Sending him all our best. 
Such stuff as dreams are made on, a famous Shakespeare's quote that tis true for the University of Leeds, because from tomorrow a 400-year-old folio will be on display there. A similar book reached more than £7 million pounds at auction in 2020. Jacob Tomlinson has been to find out more. All I can say is if two bidders were in a room and this came up to auction, I suppose the sky would be the limit. What was, what was going through your head as you're turning pages? Are you sort of thinking, please? I hope I don't sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Shakespeare's first folio. That is the first published collected edition of 35 of his plays, published seven years after his death. So this was published exactly 400 years ago in 1623. Of the 36 plays printed here, around half had never been printed before. So if we didn't have this book, we wouldn't have those plays. You'll recognise lots of them. We've got Hamlet, we've got Macbeth, we've got Antony and Cleopatra, we've got the history plays, lots and lots of uh, plays that will be familiar to people. It's hard to imagine a world without the 18 plays that only exist in this collection, because all of those plays have had such a huge impact not only on our understanding of Shakespeare and of the Renaissance, but also on the language that we speak today. It's really exciting to have a copy of one of the most important works in English literature in the collections here. It's, it's a, a real wonderful thing for Leeds and for the university. To be or not to be, that is the question. So I know people will wonder about the value of this book, perhaps. Um, all I can say is if two bidders were in a room and this came up to auction, I suppose the sky would be the limit. I don't know the answer. <laughs> Makes you feel a bit nervous, <laughs> but it's also really thrilling. It feels like a real privilege to be standing next to such a beautiful and important and valuable book. In football, Sheffield Wednesday missed the opportunity to climb to the top of League One after a shock 1-0 defeat to Forest Green. The Rovers are right at the bottom of the table, but it was their decisive goal at 35 minutes that took the win. Wednesday remain in second place, though, and travel to Cheltenham midweek. And the Leeds United women lifted the FA Women's National League place after a 3-1 victory over Stowbridge. Leeds beat teams from all over the country to win the competition, including two from the division above. It's the team's first silverware in 13 years. Congratulations to them. Now, next tonight, how is your lawn looking after winter? Ooh, mine looks... Well, I hope there's none of them in my lawn. Uh, spare a thought for a community football club near Selby that has started a fundraising campaign after its pitches were completely destroyed by one of these, beetle grubs, they're called. The grass at Rickle United near Selby has been ruined by the lawn chauffeur grubs. grubs. The club needs thousands of pounds to re replace the damaged turf. Olivia Richwold is at Rickle United training session for us now. Let's take a look at that lawn, because I don't think mine looks much better than that, Olivia. Oh, yes, but this isn't actually the lawn that's been affected. This is a training session for the under-10s, and they're playing at the village playing field because their lawn has been so badly damaged. Their ground is actually about two miles from here. We've been over to have a look today, and it was about a year ago that it started looking patchy and brown in places, and, and then it started getting chewed up. Well, it turned out that the problem was lawn chafer grubs. Now, these are um, ugly-looking grubs that turn into beetles, but before they turn into beetles, beetles they actually eat the roots and feed on the grass destroying an entire lawn or in this case an entire pitch now this team has eight uh, ten uh, teams that play and they're all children's teams and joining me now is Stuart Middleton I mean the current state of your pitch is really sad it's really important for the children to have somewhere to play isn't it yeah it's really important we've got a lot of teams of children that we need to keep playing football because it keeps them active OK, and so you've launched a crowdfunder. Tell me how much you need to raise and how important it is to get there. Uh, we need to raise about £54,000. Um, and so far we've got about four and a half, so we're on our way, but still a long way to go. Well, joining me now is um, Daniel, uh, Emily and Hannah. Kids, how important is it that you get your football pitch back? Um, very important because... Um, all our friends play and um, it keeps us healthy and active. That's right, girls. And why should people support your crowdfunder? Uh, because if they don't, then we don't have anywhere to play and then we'll, we'll just be sitting around, really. 
Well, thank you very much, girls. Now, I'll just show you back to the action, the match action over here. At the moment, as I said, they're playing on the village sports field, which is fine for now, but they are really hoping to raise this money to get back to playing on their proper pitch by September. Yeah, let's hope they can. Horrible pitches, those. Olivia, thank you very much. Athletes from our region are preparing to complete in this year's World Transplant Games. The event, which will take place in Australia, is all about shining a light on organ donation and celebrating the gift of life. 16-year-old swimmer Lydia Warner, who's from Selby, is one of the athletes representing Great Britain. Amanda Harper joined her in training. I love swimming, it's everything to me. It's really special and I just love being in the water. And wouldn't be me if I didn't have swimming in my life. In training and ready to take on the world, 16-year-old Lydia from Selby will represent Great Britain in the World Transplant Games next month. Underwater work, that's it, well done. She's well actually done, back in the pool, full time, and she's achieved this, which is absolutely phenomenal. It's, it's unbelievable, it's, it is a swimming miracle. I'll take that straight away. We filmed with Lydia when she was just seven years old, having beaten a rare form of cancer which had spread to her liver. Life-saving surgery, including a living organ transplant donated by her mum, gave the family fresh hope. Was he looking for any cancer? Mm. Yeah, and what did you do with it? Took it in the bin. He chucked it in the bin, he took it out, didn't he? Chucked it in the dustbin. <laughs> I wasn't meant to make it past five, and here I am. 10 years down the line, after my transplant, representing the country. Lo and behold, she's here today. Back in 2011, when she was diagnosed with pancreatic blastoma, um, we were told that she had days to live. You know, Sheffield Children's Hospital looked after her for that period of time, and on Boxing Day of 2011, we were told to go away and make memories. What can I say? Miracles do happen sometimes, and she's our little miracle. And now, stronger than ever. It's taken months of training and fundraising to make Australia a reality. There's a huge challenge ahead, but what a team behind her. Of course, this teenager is already a winner and now preparing to take on the world. Amanda Harper, BBC Look North, Selby. Now we're going to meet a very lucky dog who has more lives than a cat, it seems, and has been renamed Eddie the Eagle. When Eddie the Spaniel fell 131 feet from a cliff near Sutton Bank in North Yorkshire, his owner, Awina Adamson, well, she feared the worst. But thanks to the North York Moors National Park Wardens, they are both here to tell the tale. Welcome, Rowena, and welcome, Eddie the Eagle, you beautiful boy. So, Rowena, tell me what happened. How did he fall? Um, literally, he tumbled off the edge. We were, I was walking with a friend of mine and her dog and uh, I was going to call Daddy back to be put on his lead and uh, he had disappeared. Oh my goodness, what was going through your mind? Absolute panic mm. and uh, I couldn't see him below. I knew he must have fallen quite a lot of feet and uh, we then made our way back to the visitor centre and uh, obviously had to report it to Paul, who was uh, in there. And, uh, and he called the emergency services, he did. didn't he? Yes, and, he and did. walked back with you. Because he... not only did he fall off a cliff, he fell 131 yeah. feet, and we've worked out that's the equivalent of a 13-storey building. That, that is quite a horrendous thought. It is, isn't it? Yeah. But thankfully, the emergency services weren't needed in the end, were they? No, they, they assisted at the end. Uh, the the Cleveland rescue people did help Paul because being quite a heavy dog, uh, bless him, he, he did climb all the way down there at, and brought Ed, uh, Eddie back up, virtually unscathed. Wow, so <laughs> you big fellow were carried up by Paul in his uh, jacket, yeah. back into your mummy's arms, and how is he now? He's fine, I took him to the local vet to be checked over as soon as possible and uh, they found absolutely nothing wrong with him. His internal organs are all in the right place. So uh, since then, he's, he's been doing all right. And totally unfazed by the whole thing, by, yes. by the looks of it. <laughs> now, will you be going back to Sutton Bank again? Yes, yes, I uh, have been several, uh, several times. It's a, a nice walk up there, but he's uh, definitely on the lead. 
<laughs> yeah, no more flying off over the eagle. Well, thank you so much for coming. Oh, that's all right. Time. Thank Lovely you. To you both. You're liking that, aren't you, Eddie? <laughs> what a gorgeous boy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Now, I'm not a dog person, but Paul, I think Eddie the Eagle might have turned me. What an amazing story that is. Absolutely uh, fantastic. Yes, get yourself down to the Dogs Trust and get yourself a, a, a dog. You'd love it, Amy. Right, mine's been sat out in the garden this morning because of the beautiful spring sunshine. Let me show you a variety of pictures that have come in um, from today. Ivy says, look at that uh, cherry blossom out in Pateley Bridge. A lovely picture there. Uh, Scarborough just had a few showers just offshore, not onto uh, the beach itself, but just offshore. But uh, a lovely picture there. And this was a scene in Walton near Wakefield. Again, the cherry blossom out in full force. Keep the pictures coming in. Addresses on your screen right now. So it looks as though today will be the uh, will have been the sunniest of the week because it does look pretty unsettled. Uh, there's rain in the forecast, but also by midweek, some really quite high temperatures for the end of March, perhaps 17 degrees in Doncaster on Thursday afternoon. But tomorrow looks a bit dreary, I'm afraid. It's cloudy with rain and drizzle spreading in from the southwest, courtesy of that weather front. This next one will sweep in for Wednesday afternoon. That's going to bring some very mild air in from the southwest. And uh, with sunshine and showers on Thursday, some spots, brighter spots, could well reach the dizzy heights of 17 degrees. Now, I'm delighted to say for the first time this year, with it being British summertime, it's still sunny, especially if you live over the hills. But the sun's going to be setting very shortly, uh, so temperatures will drop away fairly smartly. Uh, clear for a time, then, we'll see cloud just invading from the southwest during the second half of the night. The odd spot of rain onto the Pennines dry further east with a widespread slight frost. Some spots around freezing point. That's 32 Fahrenheit. Tomorrow's high water times then Scarborough 921 and again at 957. So a dry start in eastern areas, but it's a cloudy day. Outbreaks of rain and drizzle spreading up from the southwest. The back edge probably not coming through until later in the afternoon. By that time, temperatures will be in double figures, but it will feel quite chilly for much of the day. A bright start, rain later on Wednesday. Sunshine and showers Thursday and exceptionally mild, Amy. That's the forecast. Paul, thank you. That's it from us. Tom's here with your late news. Good night.